tried to work on the colors this week too. Is there something that requires I don't know. That's me. It's slow to come in right now. Hey everybody, how you doing? What an incredibly good looking crowd we have at Padnuck tonight. Chris Sells would not know anyone was not a recruiter here. <laughs> Jeremy Foster's here, here uh, finishing up his slides for this evening. Just starting them actually. Just, uh, just starting them. He's, you, are, you, you actually have the ability to type the next slide while presenting the, the previous That's right. one. That's, That's awesome, right. I love that, Phenomenal. I love that. So I, I am actually supposed to stay closer over here so I can have the microphone close enough to be heard on the stream. Do you want to share mine? We can hear Hi you. there, how you doing? <laughs> <laughs> now, poor James, he, he had to hear that really loud. Hey, we're in November. Are you excited? Woo. Did everyone have a good night last night, get a lot of candy? Okay, okay, okay. I, we, Ramona and I went to Nick Mahonan's house and gave away candy so he could take his daughter out trick-or-treating. That was quite pleasant. Anyway, everyone remembers Jeremy Foster, the guy that can present without a projector? So we're going to actually turn it off tonight. Yes, we'll be turning the projector off so we can re-experience that excitement. Because I did a good job making square brackets with my hands. Yeah. And curly brackets, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you did that, but yeah. So just in case one of you out there has not been to one of these sites yet, we're on Meetup. We're on YouTube. We're on Facebook, LinkedIn, and of course, padnug.org. It exists. <laughs> I know you're probably not using it as much. Neither am I. I get that. <laughs> but the, uh, the uh, YouTube's kind of fun, of course, because you can actually watch this with a 10, 15 second delay, probably. I don't know, something like that. 30, I think you mean 30 seconds. I, I think you know. mean stay apprised. Is that, is that uh, kosher sure. to? Sure, we can do that. Point out grammatical errors on the fly. Is it? Was it in there? Yeah, it said appraised. It did? <laughs> Must have been a typo. Must have been a typo. We'll have to go back and change it. James typed that slide. Yeah, no, sure he did. <laughs> Shite, not Churchill, because Churchill's just doing audio. So, did everyone get the number, the magic number, so you can get on the Wi-Fi here? Give you a moment. Just memorize it. Memorize it. Okay, I saw a camera click. Alrighty, here we are, Microsoft, that's why we meet. By the way, there's a Microsoft guy right over here. Everyone get to see pictures and video of the new Surface Studio? Yes. Did you order it? <laughs> it's too late, probably too late now, so. We're gonna get two for our house. My Macintosh girlfriend is, is, is changing now. That brought her over. Intel provides this wonderful space, thank you, Darren. Yeah, thank you, Darren. <laughs> I think he knows that we're clapping for him. Uh, SureWeb provides space for our website. We have gifts that we give away almost every month. Uh, Thirsty Lion gives us gift cards. Known Amelia's gives us gift cards. We have those with us. Um, Cinetopia passes. JetBrains has given us some licenses to give away. Pluralsight and Infragistics do at different months. Also, we get pizza. We give other stuff away some months. These are the folks that make all that possible. <coughs> so 15 IT resources. I'm pretty sure I see Andrew somewhere. There, I see hands. They're there. Hello, <laughs> I'm Shock. I'm with 15 IT resources. Uh, we are new. We offer a disruptive business model to the IT staffing market. 
Uh, we do this through transparency and we do this through a low rate. With that low rate, uh, we make sure our consultants are taken care of and our clients save time and money. That's 15 IT. Thank you, Chuck. Uh, tech Systems, Natasha. Thank you. Uh, someone here from Sure ID tonight, right? You can be that person. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I've seen him. Uh, I'm a senior engineer from uh, Sure ID, and we're currently looking for a senior WPF person, uh, a senior SDET, and I know this is a dot net group, but if you happen to know any Java developers, we're looking for a couple of them. So, uh, thanks for having me. Thanks, Craig. Uh, way to step up, Craig. Sorry, sorry, Winston wasn't here for you. Uh -huh. <laughs> Silence. Eric, is it you or okay? Yep, I'm a lead developer at uh, Silence. We're still looking for developers, including junior developers, SDETs, uh, QA manager position. Um, yeah, still growing and still having fun. Very good. And we use uh, very advanced techniques to do to uh, wage the uh, cyber. Cybersecurity war <laughs> uh, on the desktop and servers and elsewhere. Hillary will be calling you. <laughs> <laughs> Did I just take away your slide? <laughs> That's exactly okay. what I had. Okay. Um, Vanderhaven, where are you guys? Oh, there you go. Hey guys, I'm Andrew. It's not the row I expect. Sorry. Like a worker, Tyler. Um, yeah, we, we've been uh, we've been around in Portland for a long time. Uh, we work with most companies in Portland. I know that I've met most of you here already in the past, uh, but we do have a, a few cool things going on that I wanted to briefly mention. Um, I'm, I'm looking for, for three engineers for a very sensitive, I'll be more bipartisan than rich, um, a very <laughs> sensitive government project that's uh, doing that's doing really good stuff. It's, it's good for the community, um, and that's all I'll say about it. It's pretty sensitive, but I'm happy to chat about it um, offline, or you can chat about it with Tyler, if he knows what I'm referring to. Um, I'm also hiring a, uh, a senior full stack engineer uh, working with, uh, with Angular 2 and um, ASP.NET and some other some other things for a company in downtown. I've personally placed about half of their engineering staff and they're still there and happy. <laughs> um, and then um, we're hiring for, a, for another company in downtown Portland as well uh, called NWZA. Uh, and I'd be happy to chat. Anyways, Tyler's gonna hang out. I'm gonna go home. Uh, I've been oh. hunting all week, and my wife hasn't seen me, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go head out. Don't forget to shower before you talk to her. She probably does want me to stay, but I'm gonna go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, take a shower. <laughs> <laughs> IT mo <laughs> IT motives. Angelo, you? Yeah, or? Thanks, Rich. Um, I'm Angelo Seminary, IT motives, and let's see, we have a couple team members with us tonight. Alina Skyers over here. Nick? Nick McWellen, sitting down over here. Nerdy Nick. <laughs> I'll take it. Um, we work with um, amazing partners in the market, large, small, but certainly in the medium space, which I think is really our niche. Uh, we are looking for software engineers of all built shapes and sizes, practically. So, hey, we'll be at the Thirsty Lion. Um, if you haven't met either Alina or Nick, I urge you to do that. They're awesome. Uh, those of you that know them, I think will probably agree. So thank you, Rich. No problem. Nick, you're working on your gig at um, Grimm, right? I'm still trying to break my way in. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do we have someone from Home Depot tonight out here? I know, they've, I know they have a recent acquisition from some of our stuff. Uh, Greg Hess, see him more at the uh, gig dinners, but he, he just started up there. Anyone from Robert Half tonight? Going once, twice? Okay. So, upcoming events. Lemon Valley Software Engineer. I wonder if anyone knows about that. Angelo, what do you think? <laughs> so, uh, we meet every first Thursday of the month um, at MAPS Credit Union. 
They are my, you want to call, co-organizer and co-founder <coughs> of the meetup. And I think we're cruising in on our annual, our yeah. one year anniversary, and our meetup on Thursday night is going to be a really great introduction to bot framework. You kind of started for my almost for my birthday last year. Almost? This last year, yes. yeah. Thank you. Uh, nerd movie coming this next Sunday. I already have my tickets. I think it's row G, seats eight, seven or eight, eight or nine, something like that. Doctor Strange. I hope we'd see a few nerds out there because that is definitely a, a good movie for that, Chris. Um, then uh, two weeks from tonight is the West Side Geek Dinner at Thirsty Lion. That's been a lot of fun. Uh, Jesse, who is going to be our January speaker on HoloLens, he uh, often makes it out to that and brings his HoloLens if you want to try it, and it's really good. Uh, the day after that is PortlandMobile.net, the Xamarin Group. They are meeting. That same night, Agile PDX also meets. November 22nd, three weeks from tonight, is the Downtown Geek Dinner. We had a really good time this last, this last uh, that was a week ago, I guess, right? Eric, you were there, right? I don't think, Olga, you were there? Uh, TypeScript uh, Portland meets a week after that. December, Padnug, I know it'll be strange, but Mr. Hanselman's gonna join us again. We'll be meeting at Jones Farm, the big convent conference center out there that holds about twice as many people as this one. We will, I'm sure we'll have Qdoba etc. Kind of the same thing. We're working on what the cool extra good prize is going to be. Uh, December 18th, we don't have schedule for the movie yet, but that'll be the next nerd movie in Rogue One Star Wars is coming. And then January 3rd, Jesse is going to be presenting a HoloLens Hello World. The cool thing, and I think his description even mentions this, instead of Hello World words, <coughs> it's Hello World uh, globe spinning in 3D on your whole lens, so kind of adds a new twist to the whole deal. And hello world. Hello world. <laughs> yeah. Now, how many people will likely be going over to uh, afterwards at Thirsty Lion? That's very good. Because we're going to give, two of you can get gift cards for that tonight. You know that, so. Awesome. I'll let them know. With that, anyone else have an announcement that I might have missed? Any events coming up? Such a quiet crowd. Obviously, there was a lot of sugar highs last night. I'll get him riled up. Oh, did you? He, he had a switch for you, but. Oh. I thought he said to, you know, unplug and plug. Oh, there was a switch. Oh, look at that. You don't Florida. do. You don't do that. Oh, do that though. Now, now you. Should. Now, now I've done it. There's Maker Faire this weekend. Yeah, just plug into one of the cameras. Wow. Cool. <laughs> We have multiple technologies available to us here. Are we good? Rich. Technically yes, speaking, we're good. It's only uh, tangentially related, but uh, it looks like Land Fest is happening November 11th. Big land party, 150 people at the Robert Anchors uh, 3 site, open to the public. Landfest.com. Wow. Very cool. Land, as in network, right? Not, not little Larry, things that, not little fuzzy Larry. critters that live in fields. Okay. Well, not land. Land party. I, well, it could have been. I don't could have been. It could have been. <laughs> I, it's been a long time since I've heard the term. I, 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 I <coughs> All right, should I talk? You should talk. Yeah. Okay. Everybody, can Jeremy Foster. Thank you. Woo! Thank you. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Hello, Portland. I'm glad to be here. I live in Ballard, Seattle, uh, Washington, USA, Earth. It's my geo. Um, and I love coming down here. I love um, going to new places and reminding myself that there are developers everywhere. It's especially fun to go to really odd remote places and remind myself that this is one of those jobs that is geo-independent. So we can work from screens anywhere. I actually went to school for computer engineering, which is kind of a marriage of hardware and software. And my whole goal was I don't want to be stuck like testing capacitors all day. And I also don't want to be stuck like sitting in front of a screen all day. 
Well, then my career kind of took me in this direction, so I sit in front of a screen all day, and I, I ended up really liking that. And one of the reasons why is because I'm a big uh, sailor, and I love the idea of, although I'm probably never going to do this, but I love the idea of just being able to like sail away and, and work from my, my terminal there on a uh, satellite connection. I just think that's really cool. But uh, now, the, we're starting to get more into hardware. We collective, the developer community, we're starting to move back into hardware, and that's welcome for me. I really like this world that exists between the two. But it's just fun to be a developer. It's a really fun time to be a developer. Um, <clears throat> the agenda tonight, we're going to start with humor. So I think that's going to be funny. I'm not sure. Um, then we're going to move into a little bit of what I call random awesome. Just a few tips and tricks and fun things. I, I don't get down here too often. Some of these are kind of Microsoft-y things. Um, a lot of them are just tech-related things, and then some of them are out of left field, and uh, I, I hope you enjoy them. But what we're really going to be talking about tonight is a project called uh, Hacking Fitness that a colleague of mine and I have been working on that is, uh, it's really a kind of a cherry pick of technologies. It's a full stack application, but it's very simple. It's made for um, for not just for demos, but it's made for understanding. It's made for coming to understand the open source we open source web stack and how that applies across the board. Um, the JavaScript stack or the web stack, including JavaScript, is one of my favorites. It's my favorite because um, I can write it anywhere, <coughs> and JavaScript developers really love that. Now I know that I'm talking to a Nug group. I know that this is a a dotnet group and you're my peeps like this is where I grew up and I always say when I went to JavaScript it w I was only into JavaScript for a few weeks before I was like I've got to go back home because I had link and I had lambda and I had oh it was wonderful there <coughs> green pastures and you know C sharp gave me everything and everything was really well named I don't know if you've looked at CSS in a while but not everything is well named some of it doesn't make any sense. Have you, tried, have you tried putting a block of graphical UI next to another one lately in the web stack? It, that, that's a lesson in frustration. You have to float, it float left, and then you have to clear your float. Clear your float? Like, what's going on with that? There are actually newer, better ways, but most people don't know them, and that's just kind of the nature of the beast. But anyway, this is taking advantage of that fact that JavaScript can kind of go everywhere. And actually, JavaScript's kind of getting awesome these days. And so as I talk to you guys, like Microsoft developers, like you guys know .NET, and let's be honest, you have a little bit of fear of JavaScript, right? And maybe a lot of fear of JavaScript, as in when you pull a story that involves a little bit of JavaScript, maybe just a little bit of validation on a web page, you're like, <laughs> like I'm going to need to have my jQuery, you know? <laughs> it's going gonna, it's gonna to help me out. <clears throat> and if you get full, thrown into a full-blown JavaScript client-side framework, well, now you've just got to change gears entirely. It's not even really a changing gears. That's more like changing vehicles altogether to a boat or something. I don't know. But anyway, so I'm going to start with uh, the project idea, because it's kind of a fun one, and then we're going to talk about this machine that it involves. This actually involves an exercise machine, so I'll introduce you to that. I'll give you some architecture so you understand the whole thing, um, from a high level at least, from 30,000 feet. And then I'll, I'll dive into the different parts of the code. Uh, and I don't want to overwhelm anybody. I don't want this to be one of those, like, I scroll and tell you about all this code while you go, you know, sorry, but this isn't my domain. I can't come up to speed on that so quick. I really want you to understand it. So especially when I get down to this part where I'm talking about the actual code, please feel free to say, can you answer a question for me? I'm lost on this. Why did you do that? Or whatever. And we can have, we can have some interaction at that point. And, uh, and then I'll actually show it. Uh, I'm glad I'm able to show it. I kind of hosed my machine right before, right before this, and so I was uh, doing not, not enough socializing while you guys were eating. I was, uh, I was actually trying to fix my mistake. So I think it'll work. I hope it'll work. We'll see. We'll see. But first, we've got to do the humor. Okay? This is the official humor section. So there is laughing aloud within this section, but not before or after, please. Okay, so first of all, a lesson in recursion. Just We're at it tech meetup. Um, this is uh, where we are right now. This, is, this fully describes recursion, so I don't even have to say anything. You'll just come to understand it. And now you understand recursion. Okay. 
This is uh, how to troll fellow drivers. I was entertained by this. This guy actually has some balloons hanging from his truck. <laughs> and when he drives fast enough, uh, it looks like, and it says you can drive as fast as you want, and then you just tell the officer that you thought they were real. <laughs> okay, uh, guess who had a birthday about two months ago? It was Linux. Linux just turned 25. I've been doing a lot more Linux development in my life than I did in previous years because I'm working a lot on IoT devices. That's when I tend to use Linux, and I, I really enjoy it. It really brings out the geek in you. You know, you've got to you memorize commands that when you relay it to somebody else, you're, you're like, well, it's you name dash a, obviously, and they're like, whatever. Anyway, I like this guy's tweet about the matter. <laughs> That hit home. As somebody who's been on Windows mostly and, and then some Linux experience, that, that was just great. Okay, now, I know that it's election time, so I decided that I was obliged to put some political humor into the humor section of my slideshow, but I wanted to make sure to let you know that this is bipartisan. And by that, I don't mean that I'm trying not to offend anybody. By that, I mean I'm trying to offend everybody equally, okay? So let's go ahead and do a little bit of political humor. Uh, Donald Trump, Hillary Clinton, they're stranded together in a life raft in the middle of the ocean. Who survives? America. America, <laughs> America survives. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Actually, do you want to know who the winner of the presidential race is? The Voyager probe traveling away from Earth at an estimated 62,000 kilometers per hour. That's the real winner. Okay, so... Um, Microsoft has this thing called the public presentation policy, which actually doesn't exist. I just made that up. But if it did exist, I would certainly be in violation for showing things like the Internet Explorer market share on the same chart as the U.S. murder rate. <laughs> Those are the types of things that if there was such a thing as a presentation policy, uh, it would certainly, certainly be something that wasn't allowed. Okay, now just some random awesome, just kind of some tips and tricks, some things that sometimes when I go to developer audiences and I say, hey, did everybody know this? And I get like three hands and I go, okay, cool, this is fun. I want to, you know, light up your brain because this is something that can be very handy for you and uh, you, maybe you just weren't aware of it. I know I, I particularly love uh, these tips and tricks and life hacks and things like that. So everybody's heard of desktop 3D printers, right? We were just having a conversation about maker tools in the front, and so I added these slides at the last minute. You've heard of desktop 3D printers. Did you know that there are desktop mills? Probably a lot of you have heard of this. They're, they're uh, a little bit on the expensive side, but they exist. Maybe you haven't heard of desktop laser printer or laser cutters. Super awesome. We now have lasers on our desk, and we can cut things out uh, if they're small enough, if they fit in there. Uh, did you know that there's a desktop uh, water jet? The Wazer. It's on uh, Kickstarter, I believe, right now. And for some, you know, reasonable number of uh, thousand dollar bills, you can buy yourself a water jet um, for your house. So I think that's pretty amazing. Water jets, in case you didn't know, you can not only cut through things like wood, but you can cut through things like titanium. So that's pretty awesome. Pretty awesome. Um, does it, has anybody heard of the Shaper Origin? Anybody in the room heard of this? Okay. This is cool because this device makes me so excited and so I love telling people about it. This is uh, not available yet. It's available like next year and I'll show you how this thing works. This is basically like a little handheld router plus computer and you take a surface like a big eight five by four sheet of plywood say and you put this tape down on it and then this computer is able to look at that tape and orient itself and then lay out your part and then once it's got it all laid out, then you just kind of say go and there's a router mounted to it and this router plunges down into it and it makes sure that it stays exactly where it needs to be even if you move back and forth. So you might wiggle a little bit, but that sucker stays right where it is. And notice right here he's cutting out something huge. It could be just like the components of a piece of furniture or something. So this is awesome because like all of these things are coming to us, to our homes, so that we on a small scale can do maker stuff, IoT stuff, and we can combine that with all of our developer skills. So life's getting kind of good for us in the, uh, the development realm. I think that's, that's pretty awesome. Uh, do, can anybody think of any um, uh, other maker-related devices that I didn't mention that you think are cool? 
Cool. Anybody else doing maker stuff? Good. Good. I'm glad there's some. Have you ever thought about how many devices your phone now replaces? That devices that you don't have to carry on your person because now you have a phone in your pocket. <laughs> That's pretty impressive, right? When you're sitting on the plane and you've got this little thing in your pocket that uh, means that you don't have to be carrying all of that. Who remembers going on vacation with one of those cameras? <laughs> it's like its own suitcase. I did forget the checkbook. <laughs> Yeah, it, it replaces a bunch of stuff, a lot of the cards now, too. Um, there's this little utility called Light Server that is actually, it's a, it's a Node tool. Um, in case you don't know a lot about Node.js, I'm going to be talking a lot about Node.js tonight. Node.js is kind of two things. It's like when you use NuGet in .NET, you're usually just using NuGet for application code, third-party code. You want to pull in somebody's project. They wrote... Um, the, the JSON project, and you need it, so you pull it in via NuGet, right? Well, Node, via NPM, does that, but there's this other thing that Node's really good at, and that is command line utilities. And for Microsoft people, I know it's a little bit foreign to say, oh, man, you could do that on the command line in the positive tone. <laughs> Usually it's like, oh, I have to drop to the command line to do that. But anymore, like if I can do something on the command line, it's going to save me tons and tons of time and energy, and it's much, much nicer. I, I don't know if other people are going through that same evolution, uh, but I certainly did. Anyway, one of these is called Light Server. I'm going to open my vast array of consoles here. Forgot that I left all those open. And I'm going to, does anybody need me to zoom that a little bit? There you go, how's that? Oh, oh, well that's embarrassing. Okay. Okay, do you guys need me to zoom that? Can you see it? Can you see me now? Okay, we'll go this way then. We'll go this way. All right. I like to, I'm, I'm uh, self-branding here. That's, that's me, Code Foster. Everybody's got to have some ASCII art. It's my source of inspiration in the morning. Okay, so um, on my console, I want to be able to do certain things, and I could go to the internet and find the executable and install it, or I could, I could use npm, and I could say npm install globally. And when you do things globally, it means I don't want to put it in this application that I'm currently in. I want to put it on my computer. And it puts it in this configured location on your computer. It's actually in your um, app data. And then it's available everywhere on your computer. So it's, when you install something in that location, you get to use it from everywhere. Okay, that's a global NPM package. And that's how you would do something like Light Server. And Light Server is basically this little tiny, uh, you guys, what was the name of the one that started shipping with uh, Visual Studio? The Cassini? little web? Personal. Huh? Cassini? Cassini, was that it? That doesn't Very sound right for some reason. Oh, that's true, personal web server. And the Cassini, I think you're right. Yeah, that's ringing a bell. It's been a long time. And it was like, holy cow, it's like a web server running Inside my IDE, this is mind-blowing. Well, now it's not that big of a deal, and everybody kind of has to do that. Well, if you just have like a little, uh, like let's say I go into my Scratch folder, and somebody tells me to, oh, mess around with this HTML tag, and so I make myself a directory, and I say this is called foo, and I want to cd into foo, and I want to touch index.html, and, and actually what I want to do is I want to say hi and, and pipe that to index.html. Does that work? No, that doesn't work. Let's go ahead and... Did I need quotes? I needed to echo. All right. Well, I'll do it this way. Okay, so index.html. HTML now is hi. Do you guys know why cat worked? Shouldn't work, right? Um, I... Um, that's a good guess. It doesn't, pow it doesn't alias this one. It aliases some of the commands, but I don't believe it aliases cat. It's, if the anniversary update and it's, got the bash shell? it's not because of that. I haven't jumped into the bash shell. I think the first answer was maybe correct if, you, uh, if, if that's the way they said. Basically, if I, if I, when I install git, there's this um, window that says, would you like to just, like, the, the default action is for you to, like, don't stomp on any of my commands, and it's just exactly because of the PowerShell aliasing. <coughs> for certain 
PowerShell aliases, um, you're, you're used to that, and so Git tries to do the nice thing and not step on those commands, but actually, you probably want to do that. It's the third option. And you probably want to choose that and say, add the Git um, uh, Linux binary folder to my path so that I can call all of these Linux binaries. And, and then if you do that, then you have those. And if, if, you don't, if you didn't choose that when you installed Git, you can always go back and add that folder to your path. It's no big deal. But then what that means is that if you want to do things like touch, you can use touch, or cat, or, or make dir. Make dir works instead of md. And those ones are all like, oh, great, I can use MD, or I can use dir instead of ls, or whatever. But some of these you don't have. Like, all of a sudden, you can just SSH right there from your command line. Or you can SCP to copy files, or things like that. And those are things that aren't normally in a Windows user's toolbox, but anymore, you might be spinning up a, a Linux VM, and you want to interact with that VM. Well, what do you do? You go open your graphical user interface, PuTTY, and you do things through PuTTY. And if that works for you, great, but if you're looking to streamline and get quicker at things and do them at the command line, then that might be uh, something that you want to do. Okay, so now I have this index.html, and I want to see, uh, how's this thing going to behave when I um, am actually serving it? And you can just type light server, and it's going to um, assume that you mean this directory. It's going to spin this up, and it's going to um, actually use browser sync. So this is kind of like the What's it called in Visual Studio when you launch your web app and then it's connected with sockets? Browser. What's it called? Is it called Browser Link as well? Oh, okay. Well, this is called Browser Sync. Yes, I'm getting confused on my terms. That was called Browser Link. This is Browser Sync, and it's the same functionality. Essentially, you're creating a socket connection to any browsers that browse to this, and so if you change that code, it's going to change the browser automatically. So I can go ahead and take localhost 3001. I can open myself a browser. Oh, oh actually, that's the browser sync. It didn't tell me the um, URL because it, it actually did it behind my window. It actually went to it. It was on 3000. So there's my high. And now if I send that over to the right and I come back to my console and I open a new one, And I say I want to code this. I'm going to open this in Visual Studio Code. So now I've got both of them side by side, and I can go edit this index.html. And with very little delay, you should see that refreshed on the right. Because Visual Studio Code, after a short delay, is saving this. And then, oh, please don't make a liar out of me. See, it has actually updated it. It should uh, update it using sockets so that you kind of have like a WYSIWYG editor. So we're back to front page without the front page extensions. <laughs> okay, so light server is pretty handy. That's a nice one for us. And that's not going to switch back. So I'm going to change my presentation mode because that presenter mode annoys me anyway. Next one, local tunnel. Uh, who's ever been to a hackathon and you're working with a small group and you're like, okay, you work on the UI, you go work on the database, and I'll do the API. And you guys still kind of have to work together, and you're making the API. And so you make the API, and you're like, OK, I've got the API up. Um, you can go ahead and make this call. And the guy's like, where? Where'd you put it? And he's like, it works for me. It's at localhost colon 3000. And the guy's like, oh, localhost 3000 doesn't work for me. That's your machine. So what do you do? You push it to the cloud, right? Well, you could push it to the cloud, or what you could do is you could just local tunnel it. What local tunnel, tunnel allows you to do is to say, you know what, I've got something running at 3,000 right now. It's running at 3,000. I could local tunnel, and let me make sure I have that installed. Yes, I do. I could local tunnel port 3,000, and I could say that I want to use the subdomain my cool app. And now what it's going to do is it's going to tunnel 3,000 on my machine out to the web, and give me the URL of mycoolapp.localtunnel.me, and you can all go to mycoolapp.localtunnel.me right now and see hi there. Okay? So now this is an, like an API that's living on my machine, and I go, OK, I just added an operation. And this, he can already see it. As soon as it saves, it's live because it's serving it directly from your machine. Really, really nice. 
Okay? And this is just another node package, local tunnel. By the way, it has a programmatic aspect to it, so you don't just have to use it from the CLI. You can use local tunnel from inside of a node project so that you could create local tunnels as part of your application. Way cool. GH stands for GitHub. Most people, when they – raise your hand if you use GitHub. Oh, good. Okay, good. I love you guys. You're a .NET group and you use GitHub. That's cool. Um, if you use GitHub, you probably go out to github.com and just use it in the browser, right? Well, sometimes that's fine, but sometimes that's not the fastest way to do it. What you can do is go install GH on your machine, and GH gives you a number of commands for managing your GitHub on the command line. So, for instance, I can GH repo my uh, – oops, I have to say I want a new repo – called my cool startup and now my cool startup is actually created in my github account I'm authenticated on my github account and it exists out there and in fact if I jump out to the web and look at my github account there it is code foster my cool startup so that's really nice you can also delete them that way you can um, create hooks that way so if you want to create hooks for github so that when people push code certain things happen Lots of cool stuff that you can do there. Are these helpful? Yep. Should I keep? Should I do a couple more? Yep. Yep. Okay. Cool. Uh, npm home. There are so many commands that npm does that um, are not very well documented, and you don't see them. npm is the package manager for Node, and it has all these like hidden commands. One of them is the ability to do npm home on some package. So we just looked at gh, right? I can npm home gh and it just jumps me there in the browser. Awesome. Now I know um, – sometimes you go, well, is that the right name? Am I on the right GitHub site for that exact package? If you just say node home gh, it takes you right to it. If you say node repo gh, then it takes you to the GitHub repo for that npm package. And that one didn't happen to have any. That's fine. Is that right? Oh, what did I type? Node, repo, gh. <coughs> that worked. Cool. Takes you to the GitHub repo. And so that's pretty handy. The, um, I think I was going to say one more thing on that, but we won't. There's another NPM package that I think is really cool. It's called Casual. If you're making anything in uh, Node and you just need some sample data, Casual helps you with that really well and it's extensible. So let's npm home casual. It takes you to the exact right one. And it allows you to do things like I want a casual.city and it just gives you a sample city, a country, state, and it's just all sample data. I want an IP address, a first name, last name. So you could wrap this with a function that gives you a person every time you request it, and it's always a random person. It's always just a, a sample person that you can use for test data. Very good at that. Including credit card numbers. That's helpful. That way you could just do random charges. <coughs> <coughs> and you can also define your own custom generators to generate whatever it is that you want. So I think that's pretty neat. What else do I have? Oh, npm SIO. When you're looking for just the right package for npm, you go to npmjs.com, do you not? This is the home page for npm, so obviously that's where you go. And you say, I'm looking for something to handle date times in my uh, new application. Because honestly, dates in JavaScript suck. <laughs> They are terrible. So you need a wrapper for your dates. You're just reliant on that. So let's go type in date time and find the best date time wrapper. Does anybody know what the best date time library for JavaScript is? Mo yeah, unarguably moment. Do you see moment on there? How about just below the fold? How about page three? No. Not on that entire page, I don't even see moment. That's the best one by far, and I don't even see it on that page. Bottom line is? NPM does not have a very good search engine, at least not on their website. Okay, I've heard that they're improving it. I'd love to see that happen. But in the meantime, go to npms.io. Somebody made awesome. They took something that was not awesome and they made awesome out of it. Now if I type date time, I get a list of 
date time libraries and they are all heuristically sorted. So look at that. Moment gets a score of 97. It's one of the coolest libraries I know of. One of the reasons why I like it so much is because they have zero dependencies. No dependencies in Moment, which is pretty amazing for somebody to be able to do that. And because um, people use Moment all over the place and uh, it's extremely handy. There are weird things in dates. I, I saw a presentation that was really um, intriguing um, about date times, date time libraries, and assumptions that developers make, like the fact that there are 24 hours in the day. If you make that assumption, you'll get burned because of, um, yeah, daylight savings time, exactly. You cannot assume that a, a certain date exists because in some places, some dates don't exist. Like December 11th, 2012, December 11th or De one, of the, one of the dates in December, in 2011, I think it was, in the American Samoa, they skipped from one time system to another and it meant that they lost a day. That day just does not exist. And so if in your code you try to use that, you're in big trouble. So people get in really big trouble with that and so you need a library like this to handle all of that for you. Completely not technology related, but um, I think that this is really cool and interesting. I, for September, I ate no food. All I had was Soylent, which is food. Are you doing Soylent too? No. Oh, uh, two. Two. Because the other ones taste terrible. 1.6 I'm trying now and it's, I'm, uh, it, uh, now it doesn't quite taste terrible. But anyway, for the whole month I did uh, Soylent and it was absolutely awesome. Like, if, like in a regular development job, I love the idea of just being able to like, I'm writing code, I'm writing code, oh I'm hungry, glug, and now I'm back to writing code. I didn't, I didn't realize how much ceremony there is around food. Like we, we, we talk to our buddies about like, well, where are we going to eat today? And we talk about, where do you want to eat? I, everybody says, I don't care. Well, great. Now nobody cares, so we're not going to be able to decide on a place until somebody just throws something out. And then we've all got to travel, and we've got to sit down maybe, and we've got to get our food, and we go through all this ceremony about fixing up our food, and then eating it, and cleaning our fingers, and I just realized, you know what? Eating actually kind of sucks. <laughs> like, and so uh, what, I, what I love about, like I'm not going to do like what I did in September always, but I love the idea that now I can eat whenever I want to eat, and whenever I don't want to eat, I can do something easier. So, little, little life hack. What's the, what's the chuckles? Is anybody else doing Soylent? Foodie. Yeah? <laughs> Foodie, like the opposite, like I would never touch the stuff, I like my food too much. See, that's the thing, is that when, then now when I have a good meal, I'm like, this is awesome. Like I never really loved a cheeseburger before because I had a cheeseburger too often. Like I had a cheeseburger every week or something. And now it's like I didn't have a cheeseburger for all of September. So when I had a cheeseburger, holy cow, it was great. Hey, on the uh, subject of random awesome, we've been talking about the Surface Studio. Is anybody else excited about this thing? Yeah, these types of things land on me just like they do on you, even though I work at Microsoft. When the HoloLens came out or when the studio came out, I was at home watching and now then the next minute I'm like shaking my wife and she's like, what is it? Another computer? Who cares? <laughs> and I'm like, this thing is amazing. We've got to get one. I've got that little dial on it that you can set on the screen and it knows where that dial is. I just think that's cool. And new keyboards and uh, mouse and all kinds of cool stuff. So. Glad you guys are excited about that too. Okay, should we get with the project? Here's the idea. So, I said to my wife, I need to exercise. And she said, well, how about we buy a rower? And I thought, that is a spectacular idea because I love rowing, I love the water, I love the idea of rowing. I don't actually wake up when rowers do. <laughs> who does, besides rowers, but um, I love the idea of rowing, um, but the rowers that I had seen are like the ones that you see in the exercise studio, like the Concept 2 that's like, you know, it's like really loud, and, I, and, I, and they're really long, and I didn't know if it would fit in my house, and she found this thing called the water rower. And the water rower is now made famous by Kevin Spacey on House of Cards, which I don't watch, but people tell me that they've seen it there. And so we got one and I was like, hey, this thing's got a USB port on the back of it and I'm a geek. So you add that together and we're going to make some awesome out of this because I bet that they didn't put that USB port on there for giggles. I bet there's data coming out of that thing whether we use it or not. 
And sure enough, there is. And I told my colleague, and he said, well, I've got a better idea than just creating a visualized workout. Let's create a race. And I was like, oh, yeah. We could have multiple water rowers, and who cares where they are? And they're all, they've all got USB ports on them, and they've all got data coming out of them. So what am I going to do? Am I going to set a computer on top of this thing and kind of dedicate that computer to it? Or am I going to make somebody pair their phone with it? Uh, I don't even know how I would do that. Or let me put a Raspberry Pi on there, and it's got a USB port. It can talk to it. So I started down the road of, okay, let me remind myself how I talk over USB. I went and looked at some docs, and then I was like, wait a minute. How about I go to npms.io and see if somebody's already made something for the water rower? And sure enough, they had. But before I tell you about that, this is the machine. That's the water rower. I kind of think it looks like a piece of furniture. My wife thinks it looks like a torture device. It kind of is. Um, but it's like this tank of water that you, you put water in the tank, and it's th there's a paddle in there, and when you row, the paddle goes around, and so there's resistance. And the cool thing is that it, sound, it does make noise, but it sounds like you're rowing. And at first that sounded gimmicky, and now I think it sounds awesome. Because my wife can be in the room next to me sleeping while I'm rowing, and it just sounds like those sound machines. You know, people pay for the sound of water this exact sound, and, and now you get it for free. I wouldn't call it free, we have to burn calories for it, but, but you know what I'm saying. <clears throat> so, it's got this little monitor on it, and it gives you some numbers, but I don't know about you, but this is a little bit boring in like 1999 or something, you know? That's, that's, uh, that's not exciting in, in, an, in a digital age. I want to see graphs, I want to see boats going across the screen, things like that. And so I'm going to tap into this and capture it, and luckily, this has a USB port, which means that they've already done all the work of sending all that data out in a sensible way. And they produce a document, and all I have to do now is read that document, and I see all the possible messages that come out. So, um, this is what the application ended up looking like from a high level. I've got a water rower, but we're, we're going to put n number of water rowers in the solution. Each of those is going to have a Raspberry Pi attached to it with a USB cable attached to that monitor. Now, the reason why I love having a Raspberry Pi on there is because it's always listening. Is anybody rowing yet? Is anybody rowing yet? You don't have to sit down and set up a computer because honestly, if that's the way it works, my wife's not going to do it. She's going to row and I'm going to say, hey, where's the data from your rowing session this morning? Oh, I didn't set up the computer. I just wanted to row. I'd be like, oh man, how am I ever going to make big data if you won't make data, you know? <laughs> So now, the Raspberry Pi is constantly looking, and so I don't have to touch anything. I basically just sit down and pull the cord. I just start rowing, and it can intelligently say, you know, this sure looks a lot like a rowing session, and there was nothing, and then all of a sudden there's consistent strokes. This looks a lot like a rowing session. It can determine that. So you've got this device code that's the same code running on all of these Raspberry Pis, and that, those device codes are talking to Azure IoT Hub. Now, we wouldn't have to use something like IoT Hub here because this is just you know, a few um, rowers. It's not that many, three or... Actually, we're working with a partner on this, and they're going to set up a studio, kind of like Orange Theory, except instead of a big competition, it's going to be like a, a group workout, kind of like a spin class, where the whole class is visualized on the screen, and the whole class is probably 12, 12 people on rowing machines. And it's, they've got all kinds of cool ideas like, what if the whole class rows one day, and then the next day, the group average from yesterday is another boat on the screen, like a phantom boat. And it's going at yesterday's rate. And so now everybody's rowing, but they're racing yesterday's performance by the group. And this is awesome. This is like, now let's beat us. Like, let's do better than us together. And there's some really cool scenarios like that. Um, but we wouldn't have to use an IoT Hub for that, because IoT Hub is like basically used for lots of devices and lots of messages, lots of scale. But if they're going to do this studio, and they're going to put these studios all over the country, and they want to be the center of data collection, they want to be the owners of the data, they want a multi-tenant environment, well, now they've got water rowers all over the place. And I'm optimistic, and like, this thing's going to go big. So. We, all we've got to do is some business deals with Orange Theory, because they've already got water rowers at Orange Theory. So all we've got to do is get, get the uh, application installed, I think. But anyway, um, all these devices, and IoT Hub will, listen, will register up to 10 million devices, 
can listen to these messages that can come in in absolutely gigantic scale. It's, you're probably not going to hit the limit. If you are, I'd really like to see your application. Um, but all of these devices can talk to this hub, and then this hub can give the pertinent information, feed the pertinent information to the API. We are using a combination, in actuality, of IoT Hub and Sockets, because there's some fun stuff that we can do with Sockets. So with the Sockets, we're doing some things. With IoT Hub, we're doing other things. And then the API talks to this UI. So this is a Node project. It's only, a, it's only a few lines of code. It's all, like it all fits on one page. This is a Node project. It's running Express. I'm, I'm like, what, what uh, framework do I choose? And I uh, just happen to choose Express. Um, but the device module, I'm, I'm sorry, and then this is Angular 2. Okay? So we're going to touch on all three of those points today. The, what's running here, what's running here, and what's running in the UI. This is kind of like done for you. If you basically just go to azure.com, make sure you have a subscription, say I want to create a new resource, IoT Hub, it's created and you've got yourself an IoT Hub, you're ready to talk to it. That's the beauty of like platform as a service or, or even software as a service is that you know, this stuff is just happening in the cloud. We're not having to set up servers and configure them correctly in order to get everything done anymore. So the device code um, has a dependency I mean to put on my architectural diagram here on a module called Water Rower. So I went out to npms.io and I said, does anybody have um, a package called Water Rower already? And I, this seemed like a shot in the dark to me because who's going to have already written a Node application for the Water Rower? Well, it turns out there was Node Water Rower. And I was like, holy cow, somebody's already, somebody's already wrote the module for talking to the Water Rower. This means that my application is going to be really easy. Because all I basically have to do is say, tell me when the data, the distance is updated, and print that out to the screen. It was like four minutes, and I was done. Well, after further research, um, is James Nesfield in the room? <laughs> you sure? OK, because this is terrible. <laughs> no, it's not really terrible. Uh, it's, it's incomplete is what it is. Okay? It does a really good job at reporting just the distance, but there's all kinds of other information available to you on the rower. And I wanted to capture all of that. And trying to reverse engineer the code was like, ah, this isn't written the way I'm capable of understanding, so what's our next step? We rewrite it, right? We rewrite it. We rewrite it. So I wrote Water Rower. And um, Water Rower is pretty robust. It basically, I, I it went into the document and I said, what are all of the memory locations that the Water Rower reports? And I made a nice little file out of those. And I said, enumerate that and collect all of those memory locations on every pull. And so um, you can capture all the data from the water or whatever you want. But you can also say, you know what, I'm really only interested in right now in the distance and the calories burned. So you don't have to fetch all of them if you don't want to. And the other fun thing about the, um, this module is that uh, it uses reactive extensions. Anybody in the room used reactive extensions? This is the kind of library that makes you glad that you are in computer science. It's like really, really fun to use. So reactive extensions is a, it's basically an observable implementation. We all know what PubSub is, what observables are. I'm going to sub subscribe from multiple um, consumers, and then whenever I change, all my consumers are going to hear about it. That's going to be the, uh, um, the pub and the sub, okay? Publish and subscribe. It's that, but it's uh, quite a lot more as well. You should go look into it sometime. Basically, if you consider PubSub like streams, there's streams of things happening, right? Whatever it is, that's abstract. Whatever it happens to be that's happening. In my case, I have a, a rower is rowing, okay? And this, every time he does a stroke, there's a, a stroke message that goes. But then even in between strokes, there's like, oh, you know, he's in between strokes, but he just went another meter. So there's another data point. And there's actually lots and lots of data points that happen even in between each stroke. So it gives you like stroke start and then distance goes increment by one, plus one, plus one, plus one, plus one. Stroke end, stroke start, plus one, plus one, plus one, plus one. Lots of events that are coming through in this stream. And something like reactive extensions allows you to sensibly handle these streams. Now, probably I I'd like a show of hands on who has used link for manipulating lists of things. Do we love it? We love 
link, all right? I don't know about you, but I just use the method syntax. I don't want to have anything to do with the link query syntax. Just give me the method syntax and I can solve any problem, any link problem, you know? I love that stuff. And, and uh, reactive extensions is kind of like, some people call it link to events. So it's like things are happening and you get to dot off of that with these methods, these stream operators, if you will, that manipulate these streams in really cool ways. So I have a whole talk on it and it's really fun. Um, I won't have time to go into it now, but I implemented it here in Water Rower so that, and then I expose it to whoever's using Water Rower. So you can capture the stream and then you can say, I'm really only interested in all the stroke end events or I'm really only interested in, all, in the event where the user crosses a threshold and goes over 100 meters or something like that. And um, so it's pretty fun. It's pretty fun um, to use reactive extensions like that. It's implemented in like 17 different languages or something. So you've got Ruby and Java and C Sharp and C and Objective-C and JavaScript. And uh, if there's a language, it pretty much exists, um, a reactive extension uh, version for that. So, so anyway, that's uh, fun. Now I'm going to jump back to, oops, here. So I found Node Water Rower. I eventually said meh, and I made my own. And um, you can see it. And it uses serial port. I have to give a shout out to the serial port module in Node because it makes talking over USB very easy. It's a very easy thing to do. I love it. And I told you about reactive extensions. So now the device. The device uses Water Rower. But now we're talking about the code on the device. But talking about the hardware for a little bit, um, some people, when they look at this, they go, um, oh, IoT, yeah, no, I don't know anything about hardware. And it just kind of intimidates me, frankly. And projects like this, like this is seriously just taking a Raspberry Pi and plugging a USB cable into it and then plugging that into the water rower. Okay, this one's really easy. And a lot of the IoT scenarios that you might be intimidated by, you should stop being intimidated by them and start trying them because they tend to be very easy, really simple circuits, and you come to understand the concepts behind, of electro behind electronics, and it's not that difficult. In other words, if you guys understand various software design patterns, uh, you'll understand the one pattern that there is for the way that electricity flows around a closed circuit. So don't be intimidated. I want to mention the node threshold of glory, which is whenever you are dealing with devices, you've got things like particle, or Arduino, or Espuino, ESP8266. You've got the Huzzah, and the Feather, and the Raspberry Pi, and the Edison, and you're like, holy cow, which of these do I even want? Well, I like to tell people that if you cross the node threshold of glory, in other words, if you use a device that is a real computer, and it runs either Windows 10 IoT Core or Linux, then you can run Node. And if you can run Node, then all of a sudden you have access to the 350,000 packages that have been written for Node. And that's really awesome because that means that instead of doing low level, like I want to do a loop and an init and loop um, method, and I want to try to bring in some C packages, and I want to build my HTTP request so that I could submit it, so that I could get a response, so that I can parse that response, and then you're just like, ugh, like who wants to do that? No, you just want to have a really high level thing. And I have a, a project that I probably talked about last year because it's pretty old called TweetMonkey where I, I basically had a Raspberry Pi hooked up to a monkey and on the Raspberry Pi, the code was using the Twitter API. Well, the Twitter API is a streaming API that uses sockets and frankly, it would have been very difficult to, run, to, to create in something like C. But if you've got Node, you've crossed the Node threshold of glory, and you can just say, give me that package, and then one line of code, you can implement it. Um, you're in pretty good shape. So in my project, we're using sockets over HTTP, which are really, really wonderful. In your world, in the .NET world, you have, um, you have SignalR. SignalR is just a library that uses the WebSocket standard. In the I'm using WebSockets, the, the, stand, the HTTP standard. Thank you for clarifying. The library I'm using is Socket.io. And, and, but you could use SignalR, and in fact, you could use SignalR on one client and Socket.io on another client. You're still just talking over WebSockets. I've never actually done that, so don't ask me how, but I, I've heard it can be done. Um, but Sockets are really great because it kind of gives you a bit of a back channel. So in this solution, if, we, if you imagine the architecture diagram I showed you, you've got all these devices, you've got a UI, and then you've got an API that's running on the server. 
Well, all those things kind of have a common party line in the form of the sockets. And anybody that wants to can say, I want to send out a new socket message called the race is starting. And then anybody else who cares can, can say, as soon as somebody says the race is starting, I want to do something. And, and so you've got this common channel. Now you as the developer just have to make sure that you code responsibly and you don't get too, you don't blur the lines between there. You still have a, a good, healthy separation of concerns. But it does feel very powerful to be able to do that kind of anywhere. You can, you can do socket IO or signal R on, uh, on a PC, in the cloud, on a phone, in a website, on an IoT device. And so you have this one really good, really efficient means of communication. If you imagine every time I ask a REST API, which feels like a, it's, and, it, and it is, a nice, modern, um, lightweight protocol. This is not SOAP we're dealing with here. We're, we're talking REST APIs, HTTP. It's awesome, but think about the envelope that HTTP gives you. You have the request with some number of headers. So you have some, some weight at the top of every request. And then when you get a response, you have an HTTP response. And there's the headers. and there's just a little bit of weight on top of every single message. Well, if that message is, you know, load this web page, then who cares? But if that message happens every time a bullet fires in your game, well, now you're paying a big tax. You're paying a big penalty. But if you use something like WebSockets, you know how many bytes of envelope there are? Two. There's a curly brace at the beginning and a curly brace at the end. Look at this. Rich gives me a projector and I still make curly braces with my hands. <laughs> There's two bytes of overhead, two bytes of envelope. So it's really wonderful for these scenarios, and especially when you're doing stuff on, on IoT, it just feels like um, kind of a, how did you do that? Now, if you use uh, IoT Hub, you're actually speaking AMQP, much, much more efficient than HTTP. Also has the ability to talk over uh, sockets. It's kind of a modern um, IoT protocol, so that's a, a good one to use. Now, in the device project, we'll see the code before long, um, I do use a package called config, so I just thought I'd um, let you know what that is. That's a node module for handling all of your config files, kind of like in the .NET world, we have web config, and you remember you have web config local and web config deploy or, or prod or whatever. You have these different versions of the same file. That's what config does, is it handles different versions of the same file for you pretty elegantly. And I'm also using TypeScript across this whole stack. I basically don't write anything in raw JavaScript anymore. There's just kind of no reason. The TypeScript looks a lot like ES6. And so when people say, I just wrote it in raw JavaScript, what they tend to mean anymore is I wrote it in ES5, which is fine, it works, but if you're writing JavaScript, I would try to move away from ES5 just because it's going away in, in light of new uh, versions of the standard and new versions of the JavaScript implementation. And it gives you some real, real power. So you get fat arrows, just like you have in C Sharp with lambdas, and those are great. They're not just a semantic uh, sugar. They actually have um, functionality that you want where it handles the this, that problem in, uh, in JavaScript and as well as kind of covering another, uh, an, a, a multitude of others of JavaScript's sins. So that's the device project. The device project, like I said, is very short because most of the logic for talking to the water rower is inside this extra module. Now let's look at the API. So my first question is, which framework am I going to use for this API? And soon after you ask that question, and you do some research, you look like this, because this is, what, this is what you look like when you have JavaScript library fatigue. That's officially what it looks like. It's a real thing. You start researching JavaScript libraries, and before long, you're exhausted. That's one of the main reasons for caffeine consumption. And uh, um, that's, that is the case. That, that is the, the case in Node and in JavaScript, is there's just a plethora of libraries. If you look at something like the NuGet repository, you will see that there are, there's, there are a lot of packages, but there, there are nowhere near what there are in, in uh, Node.js. And that's because Node.js follows the Starix, the Linux slash Unix philosophy of everything should do one little thing and do it really well. Whereas um, .NET tends to be like, let's put it in the box. Let's, let's have that. And there's nothing wrong really with either one. They just work very different. If you go to codefoster.com slash codechat slash codegalaxies, I know that's a lot of code, 
but that's okay, we like code. I interviewed this guy in Seattle named Andre Kashka, who made a library that's really awesome, and I always go here first because I can't remember his URL, so I always have to go here in order to click on it. It's this little googly link. And he has written some really cool software that visualizes the different package managers. So let's go straight to the one that we know, Nougat, and see what the Nougat package manager looks like as a star field. The way he did this was he drew lines between these nodes if they were close enough, and if he didn't, then there were, there were no lines. He tried drawing lines on all relationships, and it just looked like a big hairball. And he tried none, and it just looks like a star field. You can't really see what's going on. But when he draws some of these lines, you can see these constellations that form. And it's really neat to visualize it, because you're seeing that like there are these little communities where people are inter-reliant on each other's code, or where somebody has kind of architected their code such that they have a central library and then a number of other ones that are dependent on them. And then you're able to, and you're able to do this on your phone as well. It works really well on the phone. Uh, and you're able to navigate around this star field, and you're even able to zoom through it and see the different sizes of these clusters. And these clusters are always centered around, let's go try to, whoa, this guy's freaking me out. Let's go look at the center of this cluster and see who this is. This is Google APIs Auth. So obviously Google has a bunch of these little satellite uh, projects in, in the NuGet repository that are all dependent on Google APIs Auth. That's pretty interesting to see. And if you turn around and look at the center of the universe again, you'll usually see a few really big stars. And, and people can, well, those ones are only big because they're close. But look at that one. What do you guys guess that is? Not Azure. Mm -mm. I bet you're right. I bet it's Jason.net. Oops, I lost it. Is it this one? This one, right? Newton Soft Jason. <laughs> Absolutely. Newton's, everybody uses Newton Soft Jason. Who is that guy? I want to meet him someday. If I ever shake his hand, I'm just going to like melt in front of him and be like, you're Newton Soft Jason? Do you realize how many people are using your code? It's amazing. Anyway, so this is really fun. Uh, it, but it gives you some, in, some idea of the size of the repository. I think if I go back, no, it doesn't show it here anymore. But um, the, the, it, shows you, it showed you the size of these repositories, and you can actually search for things. Well, if I go to the NPM repository, it takes a little while to load this one. Look at that one. <laughs> Holy cow, that sucker's dense. You know that I was browsing around in here one day, and, I was, and, and actually I, I asked him, I emailed him, and I was like, why in, oh, it was in the, you know, it was in, it was in NPM, but I don't see it anymore. He may have accounted for it, because I was like, why is there this gigantic mushroom? And, and at the center of it, there's a thing called everything. And I thought that was some weird thing. And he goes, oh, yeah, that's some guy who made an NPM package called everything that depends on everything. <laughs> it's like, really? Like, somebody has that much time? And it completely blew his chart out of proportion because somebody did that. I thought that was hilarious. <laughs> Let's go to another one that we tend to be familiar with, which is, oh, great, which is... Um, Client side, because I know you guys are .NET, so you usually are using NuGet and something on the client side. So a lot of you are familiar with Bower for the client side things. Look at Bower. Here's, here's a gigantic mushroom. Here's a mushroom with a big star on it. Here's a mushroom with a big star. So let's guess what those big stars are. This, oh, this mushroom on the right is that star's mushroom. So what is it? jQuery, jQuery 5200 dependencies. And then this one down here, Angular, pretty, pretty huge. Anyway, so that's really a good way to visualize what's going on in those package managers. You can see that they've got, there are package managers for kind of all of those, but the biggest one in there and the fastest growing one is NPM. That's pretty interesting, isn't it? Biggest and fastest growing. It surpassed Go, which actually surprised me. I didn't realize that Go was so big, but it is. Anyway, okay, so the idea with an API is that um, you want it to be easy to consume. APIs are for robots and websites are for people, right? We've got humans and, and robots that are consuming your web service. If it's an API, it's for robots, and if it's, and if it's a UI, it's for humans. Well, that, that uh, is true, but if you're making an API, you have to think about humans because developers are the ones that write their code for the robots, and so it's human consumption still. And this needs to make sense to humans. 
And so I want to make an API. I want to follow some good design. I want to go out and I'm not the expert on good design, so don't look at the design in here as the definitive source. I'm not Microsoft Patterns and Practices or any of the other uh, community sources of like good design, but definitely follow some good design to make a good pattern. In mine, I, I, I realized that I had a few mediums. I had REST and I had sockets and I had this IoT hub. And I used a combination of REST and sockets and tried to adhere to the REST principles. That is that the things that you're fetching are actually nouns, not verbs. Um, in one case, I, I violated that a little bit, um, but I justified that. And then um, you have to ask yourself, like, should I extend this through the HTTP API, through the REST? Or should I extend this through the sockets? Because you really could just do everything through sockets. So you have to ask that question as well. I think that my favorite pattern now is to have my UI happen on the client side. And on the server side, I want to be my API with all my business logic, the connection to my data, and I want it to serve data down to my client. And you know, you can merge, you can mix and merge an ASP.NET website with an Angular front end, right? No problem. But if you're like me, you can get easily confused with that because you can be like, wait a minute, where's that route going? Is that going to the server or is that just going to the route engine on my client? And that can get really confusing. And you can also um, get confused about, like, have you guys ever found yourself generating from your server, generating code, rendering code, like script that's going to be run on the client? So now you're kind of two levels removed from your logic. You're generating something that's going to get that's going to get generated, uh, that, that gets really um, upsetting very quickly. So I like to, whenever I can, separate those uh, well. Now on the UI, I've got Angular 2, and I'm using Google's material design for Angular 2. I know you're like, this is a Microsoft guy, and he keeps talking about Google. Um, we love Angular 2. We're using it in a lot of places. I'm absolutely loving Angular 2. And you probably see if, when you watch Build that we've got Brad Green on stage at Build talking about Angular 2. Um, and and that's, just, that's just awesome. It's one of those few areas where these giant tech companies that are otherwise competitors can work together. And I love being in the midst of that. Um, Material Design is uh, a fun package. This basically is an implementation of Google's design language, which is a good one. And it allows you to create a UI without having to be in the UI business. And it also allows you to um, follow some practices that span different device types. So um, some practices that look good on a phone, that look good on a desktop, that are going to scale. And, and uh, hopefully, as much of that ceremony of doing the UI can be taken off your plate as is humanly possible. In the UI for this rowing app, I also um, uh, implemented some keyboard shortcuts. So I'm going to skip the code for now, and I'm going to look at the code in the form of questions if we have it. But for now, I'm going to go ahead and jump and try to um, launch the demo. I do have a qualifier here. That is that I broke this about 10 minutes before we started, and then I fixed it about two minutes before we started. And if it's fixed, uh, if it's really fixed, then great. But if it's not, then I'll beg forgiveness. OK, so I'm going to go into my um, central folder, um, Regatta app, and I have these three different components that I showed you in the architecture. They are the, whoa, wrong way, API, the device, and the UI. So first thing, I'll start up the API. So I'll head into there. Most um, node apps, the two things that you do after you download them is you npm install them. And I can save six keystrokes every time you do that by letting you know that all you have to really type is npm i. And that'll do it. I'm not going to do that because mine's already installed. But the second thing you usually type to launch your node um, application is node start, uh, npm start. So I'm going to npm start, and you're going to see this spin up. Now I'm using Commander. Does anybody else use Commander? C-M-D-E-R? This is a shell of shells. This is basically, you can see at the bottom that it's actually running, it says it's running node right now because I'm in the middle of this process. But if I exit out of that process, you'll see that I'm running PowerShell. So I'm running PowerShell inside of there. And I can also uh, open up new ones. So I can open up a new one right below it. Sorry, I had one open already. I'm going to jump to that one and close it. So now in console one, I've got my API. And in console two, I have this new one. And you can see at the bottom of the screen that I have PowerShell.exe. That's the process that's running right there. And I can, if I want, I can jump into Bash. Now I'm on a Linux process. 
So now I can do real Linux things like, uh, what kind of a Linux computer are you? Uh, I'm this. I'm, a, I'm an Ubuntu computer. Great. OK, well, let's exit out of that, back to PowerShell. I can jump into Commander, or I mean, Command Prompt, the classic Command Prompt that we all know and don't love. And then I can jump back into PowerShell with PowerShell. Okay, so you can jump around, you've got all those things, and you can create as many of these consoles as you want. And you can create them underneath, you can create them at the side, it's, it's pretty slick. Okay, so here I'm going to NPM, I'm sorry, first I'm going to navigate into my UI, and then I'm going to NPM start this one. You can see that my server is running on 8080, so I have my UI temporarily configured to run um, against the API on 8080. And as soon as that spins up, this uses that light server, which uses browser sync. So as soon as this spins up, you can see at the bottom of the screen that it's launched my browser. So I can jump over to that browser, and there's the app running. This is what we call the lobby page. It's just kind of a splash screen of sorts, and then you click Start to get into the actual application. And you can see little bits of the um, Google's material interface at work here, the, the colors and the button styles and things like that. We've actually got tabs. I told you we implemented keyboard shortcuts, so if I hit right and left, even though this is a web UI, I can use keyboard shortcuts and flip between these tabs. This is the visual tab, if you can imagine that. Pretty boring, huh? We haven't done that part yet, so don't judge me. The data tab is like a leaderboard. This is the part that we're more interested in right now. And right now, there's not a race going on. There's no rowers. Nobody's checked in. So let's jump back over here, and this water rower module that I made and the device module that I made for it, I gave it the ability to run in simulator mode. So I can open up another screen here, and I'll actually open up one to the side as well, and I'll say I want to go into the device code, and I want to run node this project with a few command line arguments. So it's easy with node to, to use a library that gives you the ability to make command line arguments. And this one's going to be me rowing. <coughs> and we, since we're simulating, I have to tell it which device you kind of are pretending to be. So I'm calling it Water Rower 1. So let's go ahead and run that. And then I'll jump over to this one and I'll run something similar. But instead of me, I'll be Rich and I'll be... What's that? Thank you so much. That would have been fun. I'm actually going to do it and cancel it so that I have it in my memory. So I don't have to type it again. There we go. So I'm Water Rower 2 now. You can see that they're both sending messages. You can see the connections established on the server. And I'm going to jump back over here now. And whoa, these two people have checked in. Now, they're not making any progress. They're rowing, but they're not making any progress because the race hasn't started or the session hasn't started. So I, the, the guy in front of the um, exercise studio, I'm going to go ahead and hit start. And it's going to say 3, 2, 1. I know it looks terrible, but don't judge me. And now these guys are sending data and apparently only Rich is rowing, or Jeremy's just lazy. Oh, sometimes the device thing actually pauses, and it's in my simulator code. I don't know what the problem is yet. But they're going to start rowing, and I have the session configured to be a certain distance, and right now it's 150. So as soon as I whoop Rich's butt and get to 150 meters, you're going to see the state of this row change. It's absolutely beautiful. You'll, you'll totally see it. It looks gorgeous. There you go. Look at that. It's wonderful. <laughs> So all I really did there was apply a class. And this is a real rich binding syntax, kind of like we get in WPF. You know in WPF, things for the most part are named right. Like they're named for what they actually do or what they actually are. And it's, it's not like that in the web world. But with Angular 2, you actually get this rich binding where all you really have to do is go change your data. And when you do it, it all flows down to the UI. And it makes really, really good sense. So that's that, and then I can go ahead and end this session, and let me turn off my rowers, because those do cost me money. <laughs> pennies, but who, who wants to spend pennies? Okay, so I've given you the background for the project, um, talked to you about which technologies it uses, and showed it actually working. In the interest of time, I feel like we should maybe not dive into the code unless you guys want to see specific parts or ask questions about how certain things were implemented. So Q&A. Yeah. Yeah, it sure is. Thank you. I should have made that clear. I'm going to go to, um, so Water Rower is in my GitHub account at, at codefoster slash water rower. So let me, okay, so if you want that module that's capable of talking to a water rower, 
then you can use that. Um, if you want the project, you go to Regatta app, and that will take you to the Regatta app organization. And that contains the UI, the device, the API, and I'm kind of playing with these uh, common models. It's one of the advantages of having a full stack of JavaScript or TypeScript is that you can have some shared models with shared logic and run that logic everywhere. But that's in its infancy. Yeah? And one more question. I'm clueless about Node. What is Node? Cool. Yeah. Um, so Node is a runtime. And if, if you go do it to your command prompt, this sometimes helps. If I go to my command prompt, I'll open a new one. And I say, oh, I turned on this new feature in Commander that opens your windows the way they were. And I don't know if I like it. Okay, if I go to anywhere on my command prompt, stop growing, and I type node, it opens me in a REPL, uh, a read, execute, print loop. I think that's what it's called, a REPL, thank you. And I'm, I'm basically running, I'm executing JavaScript. So node is, you know, some people say, well, node is JavaScript. It's actually C that runs JavaScript, okay? So it's a C runtime that's very easy to port to any architecture because it's just C with very few dependencies. And, and it is able to execute JavaScript. It does that by using the V8 engine, the, the same engine that runs Chrome. It uses that engine to execute your JavaScript. And so now I can do things like let x equal 10, and now I can say x and it gives me 10. Or I can say x plus 1, and I'm actually writing JavaScript. Okay? Normally, JavaScript runs in the browser. Node is like JavaScript outside the browser. So if you have Node on your IoT device, you can run code on your you can run JavaScript on your IoT device. It gives you the advantage of speaking the same language as the, as the browser. So if you're doing some back end in JavaScript and your front end is in JavaScript, you're talking the same language and it kind of all feels like magic land. Kind of Great yeah, analogy. Like 60, 80 percent of what people hate about JavaScript is actually the browser. And Node is a, a, a fantastic runtime that has a lot of good things to it. And it's amazing how much C sharp and Node converge towards the same ideas in a lot of places. Yeah. And I didn't talk very much about TypeScript, but that makes a lot of the pains that a C-sharp developer looking at writing JavaScript makes a lot of those pains go away. All of a sudden, you can write a class. You, know, you, you may or may not want to. It may, may or may not fulfill the pattern you're trying to implement, but, um, but you can. So um, uh, could you uh, tell us maybe uh, places to begin? You know? Places to begin. That's an excellent question. Um, when people ask me, like, how do I start learning JavaScript, I'm like, oh boy, I just, I just tell them, good luck. <laughs> because that fatigue that I showed you when you're researching libraries, it's that same fatigue for starters. It's not hard to learn, it's hard to get started. There's just so many options. I often ask the question is, like, is development easier now than it was 20 years ago? Certainly we have far more power than we had, but we also have more options. And when I talk to a student, they're at least as overwhelmed, not because they're dealing with one really hard language, but because they're dealing with 17,000 facets of, of, uh, of 17,000 languages. So to get started, if you, can, if you can afford a Pluralsight subscription, that's an excellent, excellent source. Uh, when you go watch a Pluralsight course, it tends not to be some guy on YouTube who's just throwing something up there. It's a person who's curated it highly, edited out all of the words that didn't contribute to the lesson and then published a final form and that that tends to help a lot so i really like watching plural site courses when i just am like starting at the beginning of a concept i'm like you know what S start at zero and explain it like i'm five that that really helps there are a lot of really good free resources out there online if, if you can find them code academy is a really good one code school and most of these are kind of freemium models where you can watch a course or two and then they start trying to charge you. Um, Udemy has some really good courses on Node and JavaScript. Um, if, you, if you're fine with the ambiguity of just doing searches 
online and, and, and trying to find, you know, things like getting started with JavaScript and then learning a scrap here and a scrap there. There's tons out there. It's just not all of those are really well curated. Yeah. Um, so something I found out just the other day was that Visual Studio Code is built on Electron, which is basically a Node.js app uh, built on Chromium. So the yeah. Same, I mean, and it floored me because I'm just like, wow, that's something that I never yeah. thought would happen. But it's just to show you the power of what you can do with something like that. If you haven't used VS Code, I really recommend it. Yeah. VS Code is amazing and getting better all the time. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. So if I were to start a battle against that, where do I even start? Like you described how you took um, a toy, a monkey, and you plug it into something. Yeah. Something yeah. There I have a good answer. There are a lot of really good curated, like, start here with IoT things. One of them, you can try to follow the monkey. I tend to be very limited on time. So if you go to tweetmonkey.io, you'll find the monkey. And I tried to break out the bomb so that you can see everything you need to buy in order to do it. But I actually, TweetMonkey's down right now, sorry. <laughs> can we have a moment of silence for TweetMonkey? Or at least TweetMonkey.io. I don't actually recommend you starting here, especially because the page doesn't work. Um, but because you do have to like go you know, buy these <coughs> things off of Amazon and DigiKey and stuff like that. But the thing that you should look for is, hopefully my internet connection's not down, is the Azure IoT Starter Kits. I just, if you want to just search for that, you'll find them. That's the first link. Microsoft Azure IoT Starter Kits. There are a number of them now, and they're anywhere from like $30 to $120. And they're great because like, if you get this Adafruit one, this Adafruit Raspberry Pi 3 kit comes with a Raspberry Pi 3, which is the latest one. And that's great. It comes with a whole bunch of stuff. But the great thing is that it comes with instructions that you have all the stuff for now. And so now it's just a matter of step by step, plug, plug, step, step, and some concepts start clicking. And then you do another project with it. Oh, that, and then you start imagining all the possibilities, all the things you could do with that, you know? I know what I want for Christmas. There you go. There you go. Another, another nice local resource is the local library has um, Adreno kits available to check out. Cool. I wonder if we have those in Seattle. That's awesome. And there's also a really great JavaScript IoT meetup here in town as well. So oh. if you just want to go attend a monthly meeting and, sh and meet other people who are interested in using JavaScript to write, do IT. Do you know the name of it? It's I think it's called Thing PDX. No, no, just, just, yeah. I, I'll look up the address. Okay. It's, it's internet. We'll put it in the show notes. It's internet of things. Did you have questions still? Yes. Okay. I understand, Jeremy, you work for Microsoft. I do. And uh, why is Microsoft interested in promoting uh, Node and JavaScript? And, uh, yeah. Great question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and you guys know the answer. <laughs> that's a, it, you know, and that's partly the answer. I, I, I was like, this is one of those things where, um, you know, we we can run open source workloads excellently in Azure now, and so we could talk about Node or Ruby or PHP or all these things because you can spin up whatever kind of a VM you want in Azure. Um, Red Hat runs in Azure. Support it. That, if that doesn't blow your mind, if you, do, if you know about the relationship in the past between Red Hat and Microsoft, it's like Red Hat is running in Azure, that's, that's amazing. So it's a whole new world. Um, but also, like, Microsoft really functions differently. And um, I think what really came out of all of the people that are working at Microsoft at, it, as the, the world kind of opened up, and it's, we, we can't make this assumption that everybody's running our operating system and everybody's running our, our this and our that. Um, is you found that there are a lot of really, really sincere geeks at Microsoft that just like making cool stuff, like everybody else. And um, so we've got the garage at Microsoft, this IoT makerspace, and I go into the garage and there are a bunch of guys in there, after hours, just playing with stuff. They're making drones and, and all kinds of cool stuff um, because they're geeks, we're, all, we're geeks. It really is. It's a wonderful time to work right. at Microsoft. Yeah, absolutely. And for, yeah, for everybody, it really is. It, it's, a, it's a much better time now where we have got to listen really well to the consumer and to ourselves and say, what is it that we actually want? What, what business case does this fulfill? Um, what pain does this alleviate? And, and make that instead of just making something and kind of tossing it over the wall.
There was something down here next. Any questions down here? Okay, up in the back. Yeah. Did you look at the Tessel? Uh, I did. I played with the, I got a Tessel. Um, no, I didn't get the Tessel 1. I got the Tessel 2. And I played with that, and I love it because it's really easy to get started with JavaScript on the device. Um, why did I stop playing with it? It was a little, it was finicky in Windows 10. There was a big issue with the drivers in Windows 10. And it's like I finally got it working, but I wasn't exactly sure how. Um, and so then I just kind of got discouraged and said, I may as well use the Raspberry Pi. I kind of like about the Tessel that it's more compact. One of my favorite devices is the Intel Edison. I absolutely love that chip. It's, it's still cool, and it's like the same. It's been out for a long, how, how long has the Edison been out? Like three years? A long time. And it's still awesome. It's like really powerful and super small. The only bad thing about it is that it's hard to hook it up to anything because it's so small. It has this little 70 pin Hiroshi connector, and most of us don't have that on our breadboards. Yeah, you got the, you got the blocks there. Yeah, you've got blocks to break it out. Yeah, yeah. You've got some ways to. Yeah. Is the, is the light server server that you would do that in Azure? Uh, no. Light server is not what's used in production to serve the Angular 2 app. No. Um, in Azure, you have two ways to serve web apps. You can serve them on a Windows machine or a Linux machine. If you serve them on a Windows machine, it's using IIS, and specifically a process called IIS Node. Um, that's actually extremely capable of install and, and made sp and purpose built for serving Node projects. So it's really good at it. It can actually serve it multi threaded and everything. Um, if you want a Linux box, and the main reason why you would want that is because something like 6% of the packages that are out there in the NPM store um, are native packages. They're not pure JavaScript. They have um, a C component to them that has to get compiled and installed whenever you install it. And some small percentage of those native modules do not do like a good citizen and say, if you're on a Linux box, do this. And if you're on a Windows box, do this. Instead, they just assume you're on a Linux box and they ignore Windows. Well, when that happens and you're trying to serve your website on a Windows server, it just doesn't work. And that's one really good reason to run it on a Linux box. And so you can spin up a Linux web app. They're actually in preview right now, and I'm playing a lot with them and getting feedback to the team. They're pretty stable. They work pretty well. Yeah? Uh, I just wanted to follow up on the how to get started with Node slash JavaScript question. And you talked, uh, uh, mentioned a number of points, the, the decision fatigue. Yeah. That approaches I've taken a number of times is to, you know, eventually you're going to have your own opinions about what to use, what not to use, what style you want, but I borrow people's opinions first. And the way I do that is I use a program called Yeoman. Y-E-O-M-A-N. Which is file new project for Node. Great way to say it. <laughs> it so it, it, um, there's hundreds and hundreds of templates. You want to build a uh, Express JS web server app with an Angular one front end with this side module. Somebody's done that, and you can go and shop through the list. Say eh, that sounds like the app I want to build. You, you type Yeoman new whatever the, the <coughs> thing is. It builds out the project scaffold for you, fully functional. Usually has unit tests built in, <coughs> um, and then change one line of code, and if it breaks. Undo it. <laughs> and Baby then, steps. And then do loops of that. Um, That's a good way to learn. It's a very good way to learn. It lets you um, dive into the deep end and actually have something running, for, you know, in the first five minutes, and um, and then you can go from there. And once you've done the npm install, the source code for every single dependency that you're using is on your hard disk. You want to know <coughs> something's working. You just Yep. Drill just go drill into the source code. And read the source code, which unfortunately is usually the best documentation. <laughs> when the, yeah. Not just because of this environment, but because of this age. Like we're in the era where things move too fast to make really good documentation. Yeah. One of the nice things about using as your file new project using Yeoman is that this template is a living document. Like when somebody in the community determines that something about it is a little bit out of date, they can go, it's, it just lives as a NPM module. And so you're just installing the module and then generating the application. So you just do a pull and or reinstall the new version of that module rather. And then you're generating the latest version of whatever. Like if you want to make a new Angular 2 web app, you just yo Angular 2 web app. 
and then um, some things change, you just kill that and ang yo Angular 2 web app again after installing a new version and you're installing the latest best practice. I guess maybe just one more question. As many as you want. Oh, as many as we want. That's great. So uh, the question is, what do I, I use for packaging Angular 2, System.js or Webpack? Of the official answer is Webpack. And the reason that that's my official answer is because that's what the team switched to. So the, the, when I say, I just was talking with Jules. She used to work at Microsoft. Now she works at Google on the Angular 2 team, and she's excellent. And I was talking to her about this, and she's like, oh, I know. It's so tough right now because the CLI, they have a, a, com a command line interface for Angular 2, which is great. It's kind of like what Yeoman does, except I kind of like Yeoman because they're built by the community. But anyway, you can use the CLI to say, give me a new Angular 2 app, and it makes it for you. And it used to be that that made it for you using system.js as your task runner slash, slash um, bundler slash everything. Now they switch to web app for that as the default. And if you're not familiar with what a task runner slash bundler is, it's like MS build kind of for, for node and, and front end applications. So they switched to web app and I know that web app has, is far more feature rich, far more performant because it does some things like tree shaking. And so my official answer is web app, but I, I hesitate because I still am terrible at it. You're saying web app, web pack. I'm sorry, thank you. Web pack, web pack, web. How many times do I need? Five times did I say it wrong? So web pack, web pack, web pack, web pack. <laughs> Yeah. So my official answer is that's the one I use, even though I'm terrible at it still. Yeah. So it's good to see this development environment with a lot of packages and a lot of depth to it. But now we get into things like you need something like a debugger, for example. So Visual Studio Code does a really good job at it. Yeah. Yeah. You can do um, with Visual Studio Code. You can debug your Node process, um, whether it's whether you're executing it from code or you're connecting to an existing process. So it does a really good job at that. Um, so yeah, you're right. In the in the Node world, like um, I actually asked three different guys who were principals on major libraries, what do you use for debugging? And you know what their answer was? Printf. Huh? Printf. Yeah. Printf was their strategy. <laughs> yeah. And these are like these are guys that have made you know amazing packages, amazing contributions to the platform. And I was like, really? And you know, honestly, if I look back, um, I love good debugging tools, um, but I, I tend to do a lot of printf right now, and which surprises me. It sounds wrong, but sometimes that's all I need. But that suffice to say, um, I, there's, there are good debugging tools, and they're still improving. It actually has the ability to connect to the Chrome developer tools, um, the Chrome debugging engine, I think it's called. Mm -hmm. I hope I'm saying that right. Code has the ability to do that so that you could debug front end as well. More questions? While I eat dinner? Yeah. So why would I use something like Azure IoT instead of using a node process with Express? Well, remember that a node process running in the cloud is running on a computer, right? And if I hit that, you know, some good number of times, everything's great. Life is ducky. But as soon as I hit it one more time, one more than it can handle, now all of a sudden it's giving me a busy signal. Sorry, I'm busy processing all of this other stuff. I don't have time for you. So now I've got to create some sort of a scale. I've got to, I've got to scale not just up, but out. I've got to create more nodes, and then I've got to create some sort of a load balancer or use some sort of a load balancer that enables me to take some traffic here and some traffic here, and now I'm, I'm back down to half my CPU. Well, as soon as I do that, now I have to have a back channel so that I can manage my state because now I don't know which web server they're going to be hitting. And you just end up with a lot of trouble. And you also have to, like maybe you're scaling that up to 50 servers because you have such an incredible application. And, and sometimes you want to scale that back down. So now you're, you're spinning up and spinning down nodes. And all that stuff is pa painful. We, we feel like it's awesome because it's way easier than it was when we had to actually put another plastic box under our desk. But it's still painful. And it's ceremony. It's, stuff, it's business that we shouldn't be in. We're being expressive. We're simply saying, this is what I want my application to do. So for something like IoT Hub, the, the ingestion, the scale of ingestion is handled for you. It's basically 
the ability for me to make sure that none of my nodes, my, none of my devices ever get a busy signal. I can hear every message and I'll hold on to it for up to 24 hours. You can configure that. Some latency for who? Between, um, so between the, dev the device does have to talk to a different service, your IoT hub, and then you can process that message from the hub. So there will be some latency, but probably not considerable and certainly not nearly as much as if you were having to go through a load balancer. Oh, cool. Wonderful. With what kind of a motor? Okay, cool. Stepper motor. That way you can make it freaky and go 360 degrees. <laughs> yeah. If he used Twitter, it was his last talk. There you go. Yeah. Uh, you know what? Um, let's uh, tweet it out. Tell some people about it. Just did it yesterday, so I'm, I just only written document. I just emailed to you. That's fun. That's absolutely fun. I'm so into the maker IoT thing that I convinced my wife to let me build a, she calls it a shed. And actually, it was made by Tough Shed, so I guess technically it is a shed, but I call it a studio. <laughs> and we'll all call it a studio in my backyard. It's just a 10 by 12, and now that's my maker studio. So. Yeah? Excellent. Any other questions before we close up? Yeah. You were talking about sockets, and I imagine you're using something like socket IO. I am. What was the question, actually? Uh, SignalR uh, Signal and Socket.io are good analogies. SignalR is to .NET what Socket.io is to JavaScript and Node. And they are libraries that take advantage of uh, TCP sockets. And they actually they take advantage of more than just sockets. One of the nicest things about them is they, they um, fail well. Uh, if you don't have sockets, they use another method that's compatible with the with your system. Yeah, maybe polling, maybe server sent events, um, <coughs> and the library's intent is to make everything really easy for you. And I think you'll notice that when you use either one, that with either one you're like, holy cow, I'm doing web sockets. It, it wasn't hard. All I did was kind of send a message and then said, listen to that message, and I'm done. And it really is that easy. They get harder if you need to do weird things with them but they don't have to be hard. You know the drill here? I don't. What do we do? Well, you call numbers and uh, people come get the prizes. Okay. There's 12 of Four, them. nine, <laughs> three. Do I just make them up? <laughs> or you can look at oh, I look at this? Okay, I'll go by these ones then. Just the last three. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you. By the way, I'm the developer evangelist for the Portland area. I only get down here about three times a year, um, but I love this area, and we have an office in town. And so, if you guys ever want to like set up a meeting, let me, you know just drop me an email and ask me when's the next time you're in town, and we can meet and talk about your project. There's one project I want to tell you guys about. This whole water rower thing we're doing as a partnership with a, a startup. And we're doing that now. Like this new year, we're doing this new thing where Microsoft is partnering with organizations of various sizes on showing these proof of cons, on building a proof of concept for, um, it would basically be a proof of concept for your company around some of our emergent technology. So things like IoT Hub, Bot Framework, the machine learning stuff, cognitive services, um, Outlook group connectors. There's a, a lot of these validated technologies where if one of these is going to benefit you, but you're like, oh, I don't have time to put you know, a couple of teams on this to figure it out, well, let us put a team on there with you. We'll work together for anywhere from two to 10 weeks, whatever it is, and we'll give you a couple of developers, and we'll make something awesome, and then we'll all kind of talk broadly about it and push it out on marketing and maybe give you some exposure too. So if you want to talk about that, I'd love to see if your uh, project that you have in mind would be a good candidate. Yeah, describe that. Great. The things there. Uh, there's two Thrifty Line gift cards, two um, Non Amelia gift cards, uh, five Cinetopia pairs of tickets, and then these are um, uh, licenses for a Jet Brains product, uh, ReSharper or um, what is the the Java thing? IntelliJ. Uh, IntelliJ. So these are good. Um, you guys say good things. Or a free copy of WebStorm. 
I'm okay, just kidding. So, that's free. Uh, so you guys can say good, thing, good things about JetBrains too? Oh, yeah. We love okay. JetBrains. Yeah. Yes. It integrates into Visual Studio. Is there anybody else you want me to say good things about? Um, Cinetopia? Cinetopia is awesome. Okay. Good enough. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so who's this for? What's this? They, they get whatever they want? They just come and get whatever they want, yeah. 869. Yeah, there's 12 of them, so. 849. Oh, look at that. 827. And then we go to Thirsty Lion right afterwards. 832. Yeah. Right, hang out with 833. Thirsty Lions are gone. How many total? There's 12. You're gone. 875 <laughs> 852-855-1-853-853-854-854 Yeah. Let's see. Did you count? 